Hello, we're going to be talking about C++ functions in libraries. For some of this, it might be review, and some of this might be the first time we talked about C++. So let's review how C++ functions operate. It is similar to Java especially, but also in, in principle, there's a lot of connection to the way Python and other languages might work. So one thing we notice is that there is a function name. So just like you're used to in another language, there are parentheses. Um, what's different is that you must specify the return type. So every function needs to say which type of value is coming back from that function. Remember, you can return an int, a uh, boolean, a string, etc. So you just need to say ahead of time what you're going to return. And then also, the way C++ works, we set up a code block with the curly braces. Okay. So what does this actually look like? Well, let's say that you have a function that's going to return a double. So you know it's going to return a double, a, a real number. What you would say is as you define the function, you put the word double out front. Then you give the name of the function as normal, open close parentheses, start your curly braces. So obviously this could also be int or string or anything else that you needed to return. Now, uh, the one thing that's different is that what if a function doesn't return anything? If there's nothing that gets returned, maybe the function is just printing something, you use the word void. So void is C++ language to say nothing is being returned. And similar to other languages, when you finish the end of the function, you're still going to say return, and then you're going to give the value that you have. If it's an int, you return an int. Um, one thing to note is that if you have a void function, no return is necessary. It's optional. You can have a blank return, um, but usually we don't. OK, now input parameters. Uh, similar to C++ declaring variables, we must specify the type of value that we're returning. Or sorry, that we're taking as input. So in practice, here we have a square root function, and it's going to take a number parameter. It's going to be an integer. Here we have a sum numbers function that takes one, two parameters, so you must specify the type. And then in the last case, we have nothing in there. So just as a really quick example, where you might see something in Python like this, define sum, uh, you might see a comma b. Oops, sorry. Your colon there. And then you would say maybe return a plus b. Right. In C++, it would be similar, except you would say, okay, well, let's just assume this function is going to be integer specific. So you would write int sum, and the parameters are going to be int a, comma, int b. Curly brace, and then you would say return a plus b, enter curly brace. So it's very similar to Python, except you just have to, again, specify the type of inputs and outputs, input and return. OK. Now, we're going to talk about libraries. So libraries are just like any other programming language. They're a pre-written set of code uh, files that you can use in your project. They can be libraries that you wrote, or they can be libraries that you download. Um, we're going to use these for cool features like animating LEDs, but also controlling complicated sensors. So the accelerometer, for example, the LED, OLED screen, those sorts of things are going to have separate library files that we use to write code. So one thing is, how do you find these? Well, there's not a specific answer I can give you, uh, because there are many, many code files, just like in any programming language. So where do you find the library? So the way I would go about it is I would search the internet. Right. It's always a great place to start. Um, probably even more targeted for Argon specifically would be the particle forum. That's a really good place to find um, what people are using that are Argon specific. 
Uh, also, the next place might be an Arduino forum, which is mostly compatible with Argon, but there are some, some hiccups why it doesn't always work. So that's not perfect. Um, typically, if I'm searching these forums, I might just say particle library, whatever it is I'm looking for, LEDs, for example. Now, how do we use them in Workbench? This is always a good place to, to check. So what we do is when we want to install a library in Workbench, most libraries that are Argon specific are available via Workbench. So what we do, is just open your project, go to your command palette, and one of the commands you're gonna type is find libraries. In the window that pops up, just type in whatever you're searching for. Uh, keep it kind of brief in general, so that way it matches a, a, a search term. So let's say we're looking for RGB LED libraries. I might just type in RGB. And what's gonna pop up is a list of all of the libraries that have that name that are in the Workbench repository. Now, you might not recognize these, any of these, and I probably wouldn't either. Um, so what I'm gonna suggest is let's look a little closer. What you wanna do, this is what I would do when I go through these, is I look and I say, okay, let's look at these numbers. Well, first of all, this means that 8,000 people have used that library. So that's, that's kind of good. If you see a library down here that's got 300 users and one up there that has 40,000 users, we can probably think that perhaps, not guaranteed, but perhaps the larger user base is a more robust tool. Another thing to look at is let's look at the version number. Okay? So version numbers are how we uh, label in changes in software. So this one, for example, 0001, might have been just created by somebody, maybe not updated very much. Doesn't mean it's bad, but it might be a couple years old and maybe it hasn't been maintained. And so maybe it's not current. Uh, so good, good things to look for would be lots of user installs relative to other products and perhaps a, an in higher version number, meaning it's, it's more frequently maintained. Once you've chosen your library, uh, go back to your command count, say install library, and give the exact name of the library that you found on the previous screen. That'll crank away for a second. And what you'll see is in your project uh, source code, you'll now see under the library folder, you'll see the name of the library you downloaded and then a bunch of other files. And you'll see source is gonna be your code. So source is you and library is what you installed. Now, it isn't 100% a, a true, but generally, what you're gonna look at is you're going to see an examples folder, and you're gonna see a source folder. The examples folder is always typically examples of how to use the library. This is really valuable, because it's a brand new library, we don't know who built it, we don't know how it works. The example code is a great place to start. If you need to dive into specifically how the code works, which sometimes you might need to, then you can look at the source code folder. But more often than not, you probably can get away mostly looking at examples, um, but to find deeper issues and uh, resolve bugs or understand more complex issues that are at the library, you would look in the source folder. And the last piece you'd have to do is you have to include the library. So just like you might import in another language, um, we include. So we say hashtag pound include quote, and then the name of the library that you just installed. Usually it's .h. 